Hi, everyone. Welcome to another CKGSB Americas Knowledge Webinar. Hope everyone is staying healthy. Today, we're very honored to have two real estate executives from both commercial and residential to discuss with us about the real estate market current state and key factors that will impact the industry even after COVID-19. During this webinar, if you have any question during the presentation, please type in your question in the Q&A section and the moderator will address them accordingly. We also have, uh, we're also very glad to partner with US-China Common Concern Committee on this event. Our moderator today is Mary Darby, who is the Chief Representative of CKGSV Americas. Mary is indeed a US-China expert who has extensive experiences in the Asia market, including management positions in a number of Fortune 100 companies in the US and Asia, like Morgan Stanley. She was also the chair of Hong Kong, Associ uh, uh, Hong Kong Association in New York and the adjunct research scholar at Columbia Business School. Again, welcome and let's get started. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. It's very exciting this morning to have what I know will be a very interesting and informing webinar on real estate in the post-COVID-19 world. To present to you this morning, we have two highly experienced real estate executives. They're going to help us to understand the changes and prospects and visions for the future. Our first speaker this morning will be Mr. Krish Shu. He is the founder and president of United Construction and Development Group. Among other things, he is developing Skyline Tower, currently the tallest structure in Queens, New York City, and of all of New York State outside of Manhattan. After he presents for approximately 10 minutes, we will then present Mr. Robert Friedman. Mr. Robert Friedman is the chairman of Tri-State of Colliers, the regional chairman. He's, Colliers, of course, is the third largest commercial real estate firm in the world. Both of them will comment and give us their views on the now and the future for both residential and commercial real estate. Chris, we look forward to you leading off. He's muted. Yeah, I think he's muted, uh, let me see. Yes, he's muted. Can you unmute yourself? Bob is also muted. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. So can you hear me right now? Yes. yes. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Su, and uh, I am uh, started to uh, be in a real estate development business since from 1996 until right now. So in my, uh, in past like 20 some years, I, I built up a, over 80 buildings and houses in New York City. And uh, I mean, currently I have a few big projects. Uh, I mean, in uh, one big project in the London City, it's about 67 story, about 802 units condominium building. It's, a, uh, I mean, we are targeting, I mean, this year, October, we were getting the TCO for uh, 36 below, the, I mean, uh, 36 floor below. And uh, by next year, uh, April, we will finish the whole building. And uh, for COVID-19, right now, it's uh, affected the, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, condominium sales and uh, the, also the hotel business in, uh, I mean, in, in New York City a lot. So, I mean, right now, uh, it's not only the, the, the Long Island City, it's the whole New York City, the, the condominium the business. It's uh, right now, it's uh, like a freeze. It's uh, for past two months, we didn't sell anything. It's uh, it's uh, very difficult for for I mean real estate I mean all the real estate developers in, in New York City right now. And uh, in I mean I mean uh, in the in the uh, other business very very affected uh, I mean a lot. It's like uh, hotels in New York City probably like uh, right now ninety five percent hotels it's all shut down. I mean, I have a uh, four Marriott hotels, uh, three, I mean, in businesses, uh, three Marriott uh, hotels, it's shut down, one in Manhattan, two in, uh, in the LaGuardia area, um, uh, LaGuardia airport area. But uh, it's, uh, it's uh, no, uh, just no guests, no, I mean, no customers coming. And uh, it's uh, affected a lot. Right now, uh, 
the the only probably only the supermarket hospital. I mean all the, I mean those kind of businesses are, are busy. Do you think it will get worse before it gets better, Chris? I think uh, after because we was wishing the New York City. I mean New uh, New, uh, New York City. It's going to be open on May fifteenth. Right now, the delay uh, probably going to be to June six. And uh, I I I'm, I I always wish, but I also also feeling it's going to be get better because you can see the numbers is reducing the the, the people to if I mean being affected. I mean. Uh, Every day, it's get get reduced. So I I I think it's gonna be I mean later by later gonna be get a lot better. But uh, I mean after after uh, vaccine, I mean gonna be I mean successful. So if I mean later on probably six to twelve months, I think it's gonna be solved all the problems. But it's gonna be takes time. Yeah, that's interesting. So do you, like for example, do you see you said six to twelve months. And do you think that we'll be going back to where we are now, or do you think there'll be a whole lot of changes in the redesign of the buildings and the architecture and all? Uh, I, I think uh, in, in the uh, building redesign, uh, it's not gonna be much difference. Uh, in, I mean, in six to 12, after six to 12 months, it's not going to be come back right. I mean, like uh, I mean, the co before the COVID nineteen, it, it's going to be later by later, but uh, it, it will be coming coming back slowly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask both you and Bob a couple of questions about the financing. But before we go to more questions, may we go to Bob Friedman and see if he'd like to present for a few minutes on um, what he sees as prospects and what's okay. going on with the impact. <clears throat> COVID-19. Mary, am I, I'm off uh, mute, right? You can hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. I, um, I can do this within, uh, uh, within 10 minutes. I, I think in the immediate aftermath of COVID, uh, what we're going to see are, you know, new protocols being established, uh, installing uh, hands-free sanitizing dispensers, uh, uh, wellness stations. Uh, we're going to retrofit uh, door handles with antimicrobial film. Uh, we're going to monitor air filtration, you know, clean air intake in our HVAC systems. Uh, we're going to retrofit some workstations with new paneling uh, dividers. Uh, I think uh, we're going to replace soft seating with hard surfaces. Uh, we're going to explore the use of the uh, 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 bleach cleanable uh, surfaces, uh, fabrics. We're going to explore uh, antimicrobial laminates on fabrics and, and fixtures. So those are the kinds of things we're going to do in the immediate response uh, to COVID-19. Uh, thermal screening work hours are going to be staggered as uh, businesses return to work, but it's going to be feathered in. It's not just going to start up in full throttle. And I, I think, uh, if I had to say one thing, you know, textured surfaces, porous materials, uh, are uh, uh, the the uh, very receptive to the virus. So I, I suspect we'll implement vinyl surfaces and other impervious surfaces uh, going forward. And the other issue is they call it wayfinding, which is really a fancy word for the interior circulation. I think we're going to have one way pathways, which is going to reduce the interaction, at least on an interim basis. Uh, and carpet use will be limited because that's very uh, receptive to the virus. So these are the kinds of changes we'll make with some degree of immediacy. But let's put this in a much more historical concept, context. Obviously, this is not a typical market cycle. It's not about uh, liquidity issues. It's not about a tech sector bubble. It, it all stems from a public health crisis. So I think let's look at 
the commercial real estate business, principally the office sector, in, in a historical context. Uh, before the COVID virus, 8% of all wage and salaried employees uh, were working from home at least one day a week. Uh, 2% worked from home full time. So we've already started to see a broad shift. Well, this is clearly going to get uh, 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 exacerbated, but we've seen a broad shift in workplace habits and they have a lot of implications. They'll have a lot of implications on traffic congestion. They'll have a lot of implications on corporate culture and they'll have some implications on corporate profits also. Uh, so now that the telecommuting work from home uh, strategy, I think what this COVID crisis has done, it's destigmatized working from home. It, it allows people to work from home uh, w without uh, being uh, dismissed, without, without thinking they're, they're second class citizens. But risks are going to abound from this. I mean, let's look at working from home, uh, employee loyalty uh, it, it could become more tenuous and it will make employee retention more difficult. And just as any human resources executive, attrition uh, has significant cost implications. So we're gonna to have to deal with, uh, uh, with that and how to manage the fallout from that. Um, in the, in the last decade, we've had what, what is alternately called open plan benching, higher open to close ratio. And while it's been maligned by some workers, it has fostered a culture of collaboration. And, and I think the workplace, as I previously discussed, will be reconfigured. Uh, to lower the cost of the contagion. We're gonna see many more collaborative spaces than we've historically seen. Um, but people call me, will, will, will office space be extinct? Will people just work remotely? And the office place banished from the vocabulary of the workplace? And the answer is an emphatic and resounding no. And I call it the values of concentration where uh, when you're working, in an urban context like New York and your knowledge workers, not service workers, but knowledge workers, uh, uh, they're impromptu encounters. You, you have dynamic interchanges. You can solicit opinions. Uh, when you start to speak to academics, uh, there's a gentleman that I uh, met with some time ago. His name is Nicholas Bloom. He's a, a Stanford economics professor, but he's the co-director of, uh, of productivity, innovation, and entrepreneurship at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And what he's saying is, look, at the core, stripping all the rhetoric away, it's hard to remain motivated and innovative just working out of your study or your living room or your den. I mean, we're not uh, gig workers. We're knowledge workers. Uh, Financial firms have yet another issue, and that is uh, uh, the more telecommuting, uh, the higher the security risk. So those are issues that, uh, that have to be worked through. Uh, let me just share with you some of the observations I've made uh, and what the implications will be. I try not to listen to the news cycle all the time because it, it just tamps down your spirit. It is so structurally depressing all the time that you have to banish it and, and liberate yourself from the tyranny of this news cycle. Uh, I think most of the jobs that have been lost, let's not lose sight, they're typically service sector jobs. So when they note that the unemployment rolls are swelling to depression era levels. And I mean, the 1929 depression, the great depression, um, that is not going to be the case with the knowledge workers, which urban environments like New York and global markets trade in. We trade in knowledge workers. It also has to be noted that workplace strategies in the last decade, we've been continuing to densify 
our workplace. Right. Benching. So uh, uh, open plan. And as we densify the workplace, we're reducing per capita consumption for office space. So the office footprint theoretically should be reduced uh, through benching and open plan and, and collaborative spaces. But in spite of this secular change in the way we've already been working in the last decade, uh, Manhattan has achieved record levels of leasing velocity and absorption rates. So I'm not contemplating that there's going to be a material reduction in the office footprint uh, un unrelated to supply demand dynamics. Uh, it may reduce slightly, but it, in, in the post pandemic era, uh, we've already densified. I think the densification uh, is going to be partially offset by more telecommuting levels. But I don't think that work from home full time is going to be adjusted upward that dramatically in New York. What I think will be adjusted dramatically is working from home one or two days a week, which I think can make people more efficient, uh, cut down on commute time, uh, and uh, uh, it, it enhances employers' ability to outreach in a geographical uh, radius for more best and brightest in, in terms of recruitment if they can stay home and work from home productively one or two days a week. Um, I think we're going to see, here's what we're seeing already uh, in, in the last seven weeks. Uh, on the other side of the pandemic, we're seeing some short-term extensions by tenants pending the resolution of their business case as we come out of this. Uh, we're seeing demand is deferred. Now that's deferred demand, but I still think that demand is not extinguished. And I think we're going to see pent up demand uh, within the next two years. And I'll, I'll clarify that. Uh, lenders, we're, we're speaking to lenders uh, and the, we're speaking to lenders because landlords can't make decisions as to how they're going to recast or restructure these leases without the input, buy-in, and, and approval of their lenders. So for example, right now, uh, many uh, borrowers, many, many landlords are already in uh, breach of uh, certain loan covenants. I think what both balance sheet lenders are going to do, and even with respect to securitized debt, uh, they're going to push the can down the road uh, as the market will recover. And why do they do this? Balance sheet lenders classically, uh, they may look at uh, restructuring some loans as accrual loans, as a pay rate and a coupon rate, and interest accrues on the differential uh, uh, un until the loans become more serviceable. We're going to look at uh, uh, what we're doing right now. We have an interest only loan for five years. Uh, the loan starts amortizing uh, a 20 year schedule, 10 year term uh, in six months. We're endeavoring to extend the interest only for another two months. And the reason that lenders are, in many instances, amenable to this is it does not have balance sheet obligations. They are not obligated to write down the loan as a non-performing asset. And they're kicking the can down the road and they'll come out. It's really too early to know when we look at the distressed assets, whether they're going to be on the asset level or the note level. Uh, in, in some instances, debt is going to be acquired, senior debt and mezzanine debt, as opposed to buying the asset. Uh, I also think we're going to see a lot of recapitalizations. 
And mm -hmm. by that I mean recapitalizations with equity. And let's remember, equity is dearer than debt, uh, a higher cost associated with, uh, with, with equity. And we're also going to see with respect to the REITs, a lot of the REITs have a, a product, it's uh, convertible debt. It's debt at a lower coupon rate than their conventional debt, but you can swap out and convert that debt to equity if the business case uh, mandates it, you know, if, if the business case uh, uh, pre-qualifies it as a, as a valid business, business strategy. Um, so that's what we're seeing to a large extent. The exact duration and impact of this economic downturn, it's hard to predict since it stems from a public health issue, which we've never had and since 1918, I think was the last time uh, we had this on this scale. So we can have a really good view of where we go uh, with the economy until we have a sense of the resolution of the healthcare crisis. And we're starting to approach that resolution of the healthcare crisis in terms of increased testing, uh, contact sourcing. Uh, the, the more mature that gets, uh, the more clarity we have. Uh, the U.S. economy will regain the strength it displayed uh, prior to the crisis. I would suspect uh, from today, outside date, uh, within two years, we're then going to have uh, the right kind of capacity built. Uh, so we'll be able to return to, I was going to say normal lives, but uh, uh, I'll be reasonable facsimile thereof. I think the next six to 12 months will be a very slow recovery and fits and starts will start to feather in to the workplace. I think there are certain categories, retail, I'm, I'm referencing office space, uh, retail is going through a, a secular change in the way we both merchandise product and the way that product is distributed. Uh, and retailers who are not engaged in experiential retailers and fit in retail, sophisticated retailers are now starting to see linkages between their brick and mortar locations and their online sales. Uh, there seems to be a halo effect. Uh, with a brick and mortar footprint, people are generating incremental online sales more than they would without the brick and mortar footprint. So those are the kinds of issues that have to be addressed with, uh, uh, with retail. I'm just trying to uh, look back and see that I've, I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Uh, um, I believe, uh, I believe I have at this point. Uh, so that's where I see things going, but I clearly think, uh, we will recover. The workplace will have a different look. I think a lot of people will have pent up demand. We are social creatures. Um, I think it's important that knowledge workers have interaction and cross fertilization. Uh, it makes them more efficient and more productive. It's not just a matter of managing costs down and enhancing uh, productivity, you know, vi via uh, uh, managing costs down. It's really about innovation and entrepreneurship and that is very difficult to generate and sustain uh, working in these silos. And I thought at first it was generational. Uh, I'm an old guy, I'm 72 years old. So, uh, I mean, to me, this is difficult, although one byproduct is I've learned to work remotely far better than I ever imagined because I, I've had to, you know, I had no option. Uh, but the millennials who, whom I work closely with, they're saying 
they, they have a lot of pent up demand to get back into the workplace. Uh, they think they're going to be uh, more productive. They're going to work harder and smarter and better. And I don't know about anyone else, but when I finish my day, my virtual business day, I am more depleted and, and less psychically rewarded than I am when I'm in the workplace. So I, I think those are the kinds of issues that we're going to have to grapple with. But I think, yes, we'll see more remote work. But I think the work that's going to take place in the office environment is going to be even more compelling than it is now. People are going to cherish the workplace and for the intrinsic benefits that a workplace can provide for knowledge workers. I'm losing my voice on it. Uh, so that's how I see things falling out. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And I think there are some similarities very interestingly in timing between both you and Chris. And I'd like to go back to Chris now and raise one of the questions which you answered in your presentation. Um, Chris, how do you think the financing of commercial real estate projects has been affected and will change? Are you seeing an impact from COVID-19? What about REITs, um, the real estate investment trusts, um, as Bob mentioned in terms of equity or debt? I mean, do you see already some changes uh, here? Yes, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it affected a lot. So I, I have a, I mean, before, before COVID-19 starts, I mean, I have a property, I mean, uh, a project in M house that we, we was, uh, I mean, asking a private lender, we was applied and uh, all the paperwork was done. And uh, we was, uh, it's about 120 million long. And uh, then all of a sudden, it, uh, I mean, all the paperwork is done. It's just, I mean, supposed to be today, all the paperwork is done tomorrow, supposed to be funding. And uh, then the stock market was a uh, uh, crashed. And uh, then the, the, the lender was back up and ordered the entire line out, still didn't solve the problem. And uh, this is the one, one example. The second example is, uh, uh, sorry. The second example is uh, I have another small, I mean, small uh, loan to, which is we, we try to buy a, a property and uh, we got a loan, only a few million. But uh, the, 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 the landlord, it's landlord, the bank, the bank, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, I mean, hoarded right now. They originally supposed to be closing um, probably, I mean, uh, uh, last month, and uh, they hoarded it. They want to see uh, we uh, one or two months to see what happened, because the, I mean, all the bank is worried. And uh, I have a uh, three hotels which is clo I mean, closed. We asking the bank to default a payment for three months, and uh, because the, the the hotel was closed. And uh, the, the bank is okay that they, they, they I mean, they let us to default three months to, I mean, the payments. But uh, eventually, all this uh, interest you have to pay back to, to I mean, to, uh, to the bank. But the most, most importantly, it's uh, because my business is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's differently from the rubber. And uh, because my business mostly, uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, construction and uh, developments and, uh, I mean, uh, development sites. So, during the COVID-19 and, uh, and uh, I mean time, and uh, we, our, our project things from uh, March, we was a shut down until right now. The time, uh, the, the, when the project shut down, but uh, we still have to pay the construction loan interest and the real estate tax. So we still have to pay for, I mean, pay for that. So right. that's, a, that's a big hurting. And uh, right now, even I have a, I have a project, we, we, I mean, because I, I leave the, uh, the big portion to the, uh, to the ambulance here, so the insurance company, and uh, the building department let me let me restart that uh, that job. But uh, I called uh, so so many I mean the uh, contractors. There's so many contractors that doesn't want to come back to the to the to the job site. They 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 feel not safe. You know what I mean right now. And uh, the the I think this is going to be continue for a few months. It's uh, it's not going to be easily to 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 I mean to to going back like uh, I mean before. Right. Well, Chris, well, I, I agree with that. We, we have a, uh, uh, a commercial project in, uh, in Times Square, and not only did they stop the work, but I think 
there's going to be a glut in the system. So uh, 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 the Department of Buildings, you know, pulling permits, there's, it, the system will be backed up and, and it's, uh, it's clearly going to make it more difficult to resume projects. I think projects may take longer, which means you're uh, uh, paying more interest on the construction loans. It's, it's very complicated the way it's going to uh, reverberate through the system and it's going to result in higher costs for the cost of goods sold that we're, we're trying to produce. Yes, and uh, I, it is, I mean, for, a, for a, like a commercial tenants also have a, I mean, it's a big effect also. I have a tenant, it's a, I mean, actually, I mean, they owe me money before, I mean, the, the rent, before, many months rent before the COVID-19. And uh, we will uh, try to, I mean, to, to raise the issue. Right now, yesterday, I received the, the court, I mean, I mean, a letter from the court, they, they, they clear the, the bankruptcy right now. I mean, he owe me like 1.3 million rent. <laughs> and, uh, we, it looks like we're gonna have a difficult time to get that rank back. It's a, it's a, it's a effect, uh, I mean, I, I just like before I said it, I mean, except like, like a hospital, la, 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 I mean, I mean la, la, and a supermarket, I mean, I mean, business, the, 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 the rest, like uh, restaurants, the hotels, the construction sites, all of that gonna be affected a lot. And uh, we, 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 I mean, everybody right now try to figure out, I mean, I mean, after we open, I mean, I mean, how are we gonna deal with uh, all these problems? I mean, but we, we, I mean, like I have a supermarket and we, 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 ne we never closed that supermarket down and we, we will continue until right now to open it. We, we give the people the mask, and we also give the people, uh, people the hand gloves. I think in the, eventually in, on the construction side, we, we will do the same thing. And, uh, and uh, every day in the morning, we're gonna test everybody's temperature and uh, give the, give, make sure everybody wear the mask and uh, wear the gloves. What about the accounting impact, Chris and Bob? Um, well, that's very interesting. We, this was the, I had this discussion last night at eight o'clock. Um, when we structure transactions with deferrals uh, and we're going to recoup it when a tenant, we're giving a tenant a, a three month deferral, not an abatement, but a deferral. Uh, uh, the the uh, accounting treatment on an accrual basis, uh, uh, it will be seamless. There'll be no implications whatsoever. However, if it's an abatement, it's it's uh, forgiveness of, of rent, uh, then uh, everything has to be restated. Not, not, not only might you be in breach of uh, uh, loan covenants, but uh, the meeting I had last night was uh, the owners of the building uh, were looking at uh, modifying the, distribu the cash distributions downward, you know, pending the resolution of all these issues. And most of the tenants were just structuring deferrals. But there are tenants who have who are pleading hardship and they can back it up with uh, uh, f financial disclosure, we then have to make the judgment, uh, do we recast that lease and retain the tenancy rather than risk reletting the premises, the downtime? So it's really a function, whose lease you recast is a function of credit. The better the credit, it works against the tenant. We're not going to recast the lease. They're a, they're an economically viable entity and they can pay. We might give them a, a deferral, but certainly not going to give them uh, uh, any type of uh, real abatement. Whereas more marginal tenants, we may have to indulge in, in, a, in a much more significant recasting of the lease uh, to retain them. And by the way, tenant retention uh, becomes a high priority agenda item in the immediate aftermath of COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, un until the uh, the market is is fully restored, and that's a two-year period. So, in this interim, I, I don't want to have to have too much vacant space to market right now. Right, um, Chris. Earlier um, on, from your viewpoint, from the developer's viewpoint, um, have you Bob commented in response to a question? You know, we've been moving to this interactive space, open design, densification, and do you think this trend is now irrelevant or it has to be reversed? 
are you already, is it too early, or are you already seeing or having been forced to think about developing buildings with a new kind of privacy in mind, my space in mind? Yes, I, I think uh, in, uh, because uh, but, uh, right now my business, uh, I mean, uh, ma uh, the development, I mean, uh, all the developments I'm doing, majorly it's uh, residential and, uh, and, and uh, hotels. But uh, I, I was, uh, I mean, I have a, I mean, uh, 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 office building. Uh, we were, we was planning to build it. And uh, we will I mean, talk to the architect to think about this and uh, to, to figure it out in case if, I mean, uh, I mean, like, like uh, I mean, uh, COVID-19, this kind of things, I mean, happen again. So we, we can, we, we can, I mean, uh, like to deal with that. And, uh, but uh, for, for, for right now, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, I mean it's, uh, it's not getting to that I mean, uh, stage yet. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think many of the, those changes will be more su superficial. And you say, are we going to decompress? Well, benching, which is, which is the highest density, is probably going to be relaxed. But I think what may be uh, a victim in the, in, the, in the near term is what they call unassigned seating, where, where multiple people will, will utilize a workstation over the course of a week. Uh, there, people are going to be sensitive to uh, you know, scrubbing down that work environment. But remember, we're now responding to a crisis. And not that we have amnesia, but the return to normalcy is going to take a form that's informed by this COVID virus, but it's not going to radically alter the way we work. Is everyone going to be in offices now? Will there be no workstations? No, but workstations have to be configured with at least a six by six foot footprint to make sure that people are six feet apart, that we adhere to the social distancing protocols. Benching does not. Uh, and we're going to see more and more collaborative spaces because if people are going to work from home two days a week, they're going to be in the workplace uh, with the express purpose of collaborating. And they want to collaborate. We're going to have more collaborative spaces rather than less. And there'll be smaller collaborative spaces than we've traditionally had. So I think the configuration is going to change, but uh, uh, We'll have to value engineer the workplace for this uh, for this crisis. It it could happen again in the form of some other uh, virus, and I think we have a a pretty accelerated learning curve over about how to deal with it. And I think we'll handle it a lot better, and we'll reduce the cycle time of uh, uh, quarantining like we have now. Um. Let's turn to a couple questions from the audience. Um, either, and maybe, maybe Chris, you'll comment on, on, on the residential more and Bob a little more on, on the commercial, but maybe both answer this. The people, when is it gonna be time to get bargains? If I'm in the market for residential apartment or condo, um, is it time now? When, what do you think? You know, these are people that want to take advantage of the situation. Chris, do you want to talk first? Yes. Uh, I mean, right now it's uh, it's not like a 2000. I mean, 2008. I mean, it's uh, because after 2008. I mean, like, around 2009, 2010. It's uh, you, you try to sell the condos, but nobody come to look at your apartments. But right now it's a difference. So, so every I mean, every week or a week or two weeks, we we still have a uh, people. I mean, uh, because I mean, we have an internet. I mean, we, I mean, we we set up on the internet. People can walk through the, I mean, the, the apartment. I mean, through the internet, who can see the inside of the, of the apartment finished. But uh, we still have lots of people. I mean, I mean, the, the, the make appointments to 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 see the, to uh, see the apartments, and uh, still asking the I mean the, the, the I mean price better. But they want to. They, they, they I mean. They, they look like they're willing. They want to bugging. They want to knock <laughs> down like, <laughs> yeah. They try to knock down like 10%, 15%, you know, they, they, they're they asking. So, so when we're going to lower down the price, but, uh, you know, so right, uh, so 
it's a, it's a, the difference from the 2000, 2008 and, and, and right now, because the interest in 2008, the interest was very high. And uh, I mean, right now, the, the, for, for, for the, the, I mean, the uh, residential apartments, if you go to bank to get a loan and your credit is good and the, the interest is very low, it's only around like 3%, you know. So if you compare to 2008, it's totally different. So, so the certain people who have the money on their hand, they're still looking to buy the apartments because if they buy an apartment right now and they, they, get, they, get, they get a loan 15 years, 20 years, they can lock down that interest for like 15, 20 years, which is, I mean, for, for the long run, it's very good. It's, I mean, for, for everybody. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's interesting that the, the cost of debt uh, um, is, is clearly uh, a very significant value creator. In, uh, in the real estate market. But what we're also going to find is, this is the time to monitor assets, uh, to see when and if they become distressed. And real estate is still going to be a very attractive category. Uh, and part of it has to do with, uh, you know, all time historic low, debt cost, when you look at cap rates, I mean, let's take a benchmark equivalents, 10-year treasuries. What are 10 years, 10 year treasuries trading at? 1%? So you have to look at uh, investors who are chasing yield. Uh, the cap rates, most people think, are really going to decompress and, and reduce the value of the real estate. I'm not so sure. I think with the cost of debt and cap rates are really a function of uh, cost of debt and the perceived risk profile of the investment. You know, you're trading off liquidity to some extent. That's why REITs, that's how REITs evolved. You know, the theory was you trade off liquidity when you buy a real estate asset, but uh, with a REIT, uh, it's traded as a security every day. So you can get in and out of that market. I actually think that we don't have any key indicators that there'll be distressed property like there was after 2001 or there was after uh, 2008. I think if you have equity, uh, you'll be able to deploy it very effectively. Uh, distress is an emotionally charged term. Some product will be distressed. It's a matter of product that's over leveraged now uh, with, with MES debt on it uh, might be distressed, but to the extent that you can kick the can down the road and uh, uh, defer uh, amortization payments, uh, not that you're being relieved of the obligation, you're, you're, you're paying it back later. Um, we, we'll see, I think it is the perfect time to monitor the market so that if, if the market does get very distressed, you can exploit it and you can exploit it readily. Uh, it, so this is, an educational ramp up before we see what ultimately evolves with the market. Uh, for some reason, your video, we lost your picture. Uh, um, but I thought we could maybe go to the audience. Oh, can you, am I back? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so you're, you're back. Yeah. yeah. Um, now there's one question from the audience. He's raised his hand. Michelle, can you connect him? Michael O'Hara, he's muted. Oh, I know Michael. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much for a very informative uh, and excellent uh, discussion. Uh, my one question is uh, to Bob, whom I know well, and thank you for inviting me, Bob. My uh, God. And, and I think you answered my question in your last intervention, which was I was uh, going to request more clarification between the trend in the last decade towards densification in the workplace versus the need for increased social distancing as a result of the pandemic. And uh, I think, again, from what you said at the very end, I, uh, there are four types of arrangements, if you will, in the workplace. There's the unassigned office space seating. There's the collaborative space area. There's the benching area, more the opening, and then there's the assigned seating, the offices. And so in order to 
maintain a, a similar densification model. Uh, I'm understanding we will have to do a certain amount of reconfiguration or retrofitting. And with the unassigned, that means that if there is any space, that will have to be particularly uh, well scrubbed and uh, subject to retrofitting. Uh, with the collaborative area, that will go, that will increase. And similarly, uh, they'll have to give uh, attention to the uh, social distancing requirements. And since there'll be turnover, the, the scrubbing, uh, cleansing. Benchmarking, my understanding is more of a reconfiguration. Yes. Uh, and then for the assigned office space, it's basically will stay the same because you already have social distancing. So maybe if you could just confirm my understanding yeah. because I, I think you're 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 right. I think a lot of this is it's optics is the wrong word, but a lot of it, for example, even in collaborative spaces also, the the uh, uh, cleaning regimen, you know, swabbing down the surfaces uh, periodically uh, over the course of the day. What what most people, there's so many economic implications that we haven't even sorted out. Uh, the traditional cleaning schedule in an office building is going to have to be dramatically enhanced in light of COVID. Who pays for it? Uh, landlord or tenant? So we'll have to reapportion some of, some of the risk but there, the, the, the uh, enhanced uh, rigor and vigilance with respect to uh, maintaining the office and cleaning the office <clears throat> now becomes a much higher priority agenda item than it ever was uh, with cost implications. Um, I'd like to jump in because thank you, thank you Michael. Um, there are a number of questions from the audience and we have a limited time left. What's so the timing on what the we timing? We have about five more minutes. Okay. Um, and there's a question to both of you, which is asking about the WeWorks type of commercial real estate. And That's the a great WeWorks question. Type of commercial real estate. Most of their tenants are small businesses. They say who are suffering from this pandemic. And how do you see the impact or trend, which was so strong for WeWork just prior to COVID-19? Maybe both of you will comment. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start. First of all, we put it in historical context, the co-working sector represents approximately 15 million square feet in Manhattan, uh, Midtown, Midtown South, and Downtown. That represents almost 3% of the office market. Um, first, we work, for example, is recasting all of their leases as we speak. We all know about uh, the, the soft bank capital, soft bank's capital infusion or, or lack thereof. The, these, these businesses are not as well capitalized as they were. And I think we're going to see uh, some uh, write down. I mean, I never understood. We work had uh, 15 times the market cap that Regis had. Uh, I, I, I think WeWork was, was hyped beyond comprehension as, as a new social uh, uh, organic uh, uh, enterprise that transcended the, the real estate and the workplace. And they, they sold it for a while, but ultimately uh, they couldn't sell it anymore. I, I think you're going to see a rollback in that context and landlords who have co-working tenants are going to have to restructure those leases uh, and that has, that has implications with the lender. So we're going to see some fallout from that sector. In fact, I think that's the most serious fallout from this very well might be in the, uh, in the co-working environment. But conversely, to the, to the extent that there's uh, dislocation uh, with firms. A, a lot of people will start up smaller businesses and they will be gravitating to the WeWorks and the Regis's of the world uh, because they won't be employed by their mega employers anymore. So there's a whole push-pull dynamic 
there's Great. an ecosystem that works that way. Thanks. And Chris, do you want to jump in with any thoughts? Yes. Uh, I, 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 I think right now, because, uh, you know, it's very difficult to say. A lot of, I mean, uh, all the office is empty, like a store empty. And uh, the, the, the tenant doesn't want to pay the rent because they, did, they didn't do any business. But uh, to the owner, to the real estate owner, I mean, uh, they, I mean, they have to c collect the rent to pay the interest for, to the, I mean, the mortgage to the, to the bank. So at this point, I think, I think the government, I mean, have to be stepping to, because the government already stepping to help the, all the workers or whatever, and the small business. But uh, I think, I mean, on the other hand, the city, I mean, the city government have to be, I mean, the, give the abatements, of, I mean, the tax abatement for the, all the real estate tax, I mean, give some abatements to, to all the real estate own, owners. And uh, or in, the, in, the, in the same hand, I mean, have to be, we have to be, I mean, figured out how to how to deal with the with the, I mean all, all this rent going to be paid by the the, the I mean the tenant and uh, also the, the interest I mean to pay I mean from from the owner to the bank, so I think government have to be I mean figured out and uh, pass some law to to help all I mean all the real estate I mean I mean owners. Mm -hmm. Okay, for both of you, these have to be close to one word answers. One is. Do you think that the cap rate increase is is now the highest, I guess, in New York? And second, do you feel that the rental price of office buildings will be impacted in the next six to 12 months? Chris, okay. do you want to answer first and then Bob? Yes, I, I think, uh, I, I think in the, in the, I mean, probably next year or two, the, 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 I mean, the rent will be affected a lot because of, because of the COVID-19. And uh, I mean, because right now, uh, I mean, this COVID-19 hap happens until right now, a lot of people, the senior people, or, or a lot, um, I mean, uh, even the other, I mean, the young people, they, they have a bunch of other people. They're scared, they're scared to go out, to meet the people, to have, a, I mean, to, 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 to sit together. So I think it's going to be affected a lot. Um, two things. I, yes, in response to uh, rents getting tamped down in the immediate aftermath of uh, COVID-19, yes. I think it would be foolhardy to think anything else. Uh, but the more <clears throat> transparency we have, uh, the more uh, resolution we have with respect to the public health crisis, the better it is for the real estate markets, no question. The, the, and the first question you, you asked, uh, I think the cap rates in New York, uh, well, remember, the lower the cap rate, the higher the asset value. Right. So I think New York is a global market. I, I, I think that uh, uh, cap rates will not decompress significantly in New York, somewhat. In other words, asset values will be will be trimmed uh, a little, but as long as the can, the can is kicked down the road, uh, th there won't be a, a, a permanent impairment to the debt. In other words, it's all keyed to write downs, every industry, you, you know, the banking industry. If you have to write down a real estate asset as a non-performing asset, that can materially and adversely affect your capital to assets ratio, and it, it just reverberates through the banking system. So I, I think that cap rates, I, I think more importantly than cap rates, whether they decompress, there will be properties available to buy in this cycle that would not have been available but for the COVID virus. Mm. And I, <laughs> in other words, <laughs> that, that to me may be the most compelling differentiator than what happens to the cap rates. Well, I want to end because there's several questions and maybe for those of you that we didn't get to your questions, we'll be able to answer them in writing or in some way after the webinar. But I would like to close with one final question from the audience. And maybe you can, it has to be very brief because we're actually at 11.01. Um, opportunity zone. Can you pick one asset class wh which is being impacted now that you think the performance will improve or drastically uh, be hurt, which I think you kind of did with with WeChat. Um, but could you just comment on 
what on an opportunity zone now with the you know because of the impact of covid will provide an opportunity post covid those asset classes well, the opportunity zone um, and I, is basically a 1031 exchange on steroids you know a like kind exchange where the taxable event is deferred but most importantly you look at the real estate assets and they have to stand alone uh, on market fundamentals. The, the opportunity zone is the flavor enhancer, the, the enricher. It, it makes it that much more leveraged a transaction. So it applies to all classes equally. The, where you find the best value, the opportunity zone is going to leverage it, leverage it further. Um, so, low and income by the way, in Manhattan, low in Manhattan, income housing, Bob, or Chris, what do you see? Low income housing there. Well, I, low, I income think... low income housing is much more problematical than people think. With with uh, Mayor De Blasio's uh, initiative on affordable housing, uh, if you elect for twenty or twenty five percent of uh, uh, the housing to be affordable that uh, landlords aren't making money on that, that affordable housing. They're making money on the market rate housing. Mm -hmm. There's another market that has been adversely affected by uh, uh, legislation, which is um, regulated tenancy or what they call statutory tenancy, right. a rent controlled or rent stabilized tenants. Uh, landlords are precluded from making major capital commitments because they cannot raise the rents sufficiently to justify the expense. So I think it's one of the most ill-considered pieces of legislation that will adversely affect a lot of the housing stock pre-1974. With, with, so the answer is no, I, I, I don't like that asset class, okay. but that's because it's been artificially tamped down by what I think is inane legislation. We need to cl wrap up, Chris. I'm going to let you make any final remarks you'd like to in response to asset class, opportunity zone, or whatever. Uh, the, uh, the opportunity zone, it, it, it depends. I mean, I mean, the, the building is finished. It's finished. I mean, it's finished right now or, or in next, uh, like, I mean, six to 12 months, it's probably going to be a factor. But in the long run after, I mean, I mean, if you just started a new, new construction, I mean, just, uh, I mean, just did a, the, the 1031 exchange and start a new construction. That's going to be after you finish. It's already three years later. I don't think it's going to be effective for, I mean, for, for, do, I mean, for those projects. Okay. But, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, I mean, again, so I hope the government stepping to help all, I mean, the real estate owners and, uh, and reduce, the, I mean, the real estate tax for, I mean, during this, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, very hard time. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, the, I mean from right now to, to whatever, maybe six to 12 months, you know. Great. Well, thank you both, Chris and Robert, so much. This was extremely interesting, provocative, and informative. And I'm very sorry that there are a number of questions that we did not get to answer, but we will try to follow up following the webinar. Thank you again. We hope to thank have you everybody. back in thank, another Thank year. you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Have a nice Bye -bye. day. Bye-bye. Okay. Be well. Everyone be, be well. well. Be yeah. safe. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>